What was the non-violent Indian reform movement? It was the movement led by Indian nationalist leader Mohandas Gandhi, 1869-1948. Whose methods of protest included staging boycotts, fasting, conducting prayer vigils, and visiting troubled areas in an attempt to end conflicts. Gandhi, whom the people called Mahatma, meaning great souled, was determined to bring about change in India to bring an end to British control of the country and to topple the ages-old caste system, the strict social structure, there. Gandhi believed that it took great courage to not engage in violence. And he began campaigns of passive resistance, which he called Satyagraha, meaning firmness in truth. Gaining a wide following, Gandhi's acts of civil disobedience did bring about changes in his homeland where he is revered as the founder of an independent India, 1947. He remained faithful to his nonviolent beliefs throughout his life. He also adhered to a firm policy of religious tolerance. It was for this reason that the spiritual and nationalist leader was killed by a Hindu extremist in 1948. How were finished goods produced before the Industrial Revolution? Before the factory and machine age ushered in by the Industrial Revolution. People made many of their own finished goods, bought them from small-scale producers, who manufactured the goods largely by hand or bought them from merchants who contracted home workers to produce goods. The putting out system was a production method that was used in New England from the mid 1700s to the early 1800s. It worked this way, merchants supplied raw materials, cotton, for example. To families, especially women and young girls, who would make partially finished goods, thread, or fully finished goods, cloth, for the merchant. These manufactured goods were then sold by the merchant. Homeworkers, who put out goods, provided the needed manufacturing labor of the day. What were carpetbaggers? Carpetbaggers was a derisive term that referred to northerners who arrived in the south in the early days of Reconstruction. 1865 to 77, the 12 year period of rebuilding that followed the American Civil War. 1861 to 65 Even though many of these northern businessmen intended to settle in the south southerners viewed them as outsiders and worse as opportunists who only intended to make a quick profit before returning north They were called carpetbaggers because many carried carpet bags as luggage some southerners even quipped that these northerners could carry all their belongings in a carpet bag. Implying that they were nothing more than transients. Nevertheless, northerners who relocated to the south following. The Civil War played an important role during Reconstruction. Some, 
aided by the black vote, gained public office and impacted state and local policy. But others proved to be corrupt. Because of the latter, the term carpetbagger became synonymous with a meddling, opportunistic outsider. What was the trial of the 20th century? As the century drew to a close, American historians, legal experts, and the public considered which of the many trials hailed as the trial of the 20th century actually was. But the criteria used by each person varied, some believed the most important trial was the most highly publicized. Others believed it was a trial in which the verdict affected everyone. Some thought it was a trial that most epitomized an era. And some believed the most important trial was the one that inspired the most public debate. Still others looked for a single trial that seemed to have it all. Notoriety, impact, reflections of society at large, and a controversial outcome. Among the courtroom dramas that were mentioned were, the 1907-1908 trial of Harry Thaw, 1871-1947. Whose lawyers went through two trials, the first ended in a deadlocked jury, to convince jurors that Mr. Thaw suffered from dementia Americans, a condition supposedly unique to American men. That had caused Thaw to experience an uncontrollable desire to kill a man who had had an affair with his wife. The case took innocent by reason of insanity to new heights. The well-to-do, Harvard-educated Thaw was declared not guilty. The 1921 case of Nicola Sacco, 1891-1927, and Bartolomeo Vanzetti, 1888-1927. Italian-born anarchists charged with and, amidst international uproar, found guilty of murder and robbery. So many people were convinced of the pair's innocence that demonstrations were mounted in cities around the world. They were executed in August 1927, but 50 years later Governor Michael Dukakis of Massachusetts signed a special proclamation clearing their names. The Bruno Richard Hauptmann 1899-1936, Trial of 1935 The German-born defendant was convicted of murdering the 20-month-old son of celebrated aviator Charles A. Lindbergh, 1902-1974, and his noted wife Anne Morrow Lindbergh, 1906-2001. After the child was kidnapped from the family's Hopewell, New Jersey. Home on March 1, 1932. For two and a half months, the world had prayed for the safe return of Charles Jr. But the toddler's body was found on May 12, two miles from the Lindbergh home. Public outrage. Demanded justice. Evidence surfaced that implicated Hauptmann, who was tried January 2nd to February 13th, 1935. Found guilty, he died by electrocution. Influential journalist H. L. Mencken noted that the trial, in which the conviction seemed to hinge on circumstantial evidence and which was attended by a circus like atmosphere, was the biggest story since the resurrection. 
though many remained convinced that officials had acted hastily to bring a case against Hauptmann. And maintained that he'd been framed, efforts to clear his name continued to be denied into the 1990s. The 1931-1937 trials of the so-called Scottsboro Boys, nine men. Ranging in age from 12 to 20, who had been seized from several points along a 42-car train. In northeastern Alabama and were promptly charged with raping two white women. Upon medical examination, the women showed no signs of having been raped or even of having had intercourse in the time frame in question. Nevertheless, the court of public opinion in the segregated South saw to it that eight of the nine were convicted of the crime. In spite of overwhelming evidence and testimony supporting their innocence. The 1995 case of former football player O.J. Simpson, 1947 who was tried and acquitted in the murders of his former wife, Nicole, and her friend, Ronald Goldman. One observer said this trial had it all, women, minorities, public interest, domestic violence. Fallen hero, and through its live media coverage had exposed the legal system to the public. Other trials routinely mentioned in considering the question included the cases of convicted murderers Leopold and Loeb. The infamous Scopes Monkey Trial, which pitted faith against reason. Religion against science, and tradition against modernity, the Nuremberg Trials. Which established a process that brought war criminals to justice, the case of Alger Hiss, who was either a traitor or the victim of a framing for political advantages at the highest levels, and the Rosenberg espionage case. Undoubtedly there are trials missing from even this long list. There can be no definitive answer to the question. How old is golf? Some historians trace golf back to a Roman game called Paganica. When they occupied Great Britain between roughly AD 43 until 410. Romans played the game in the streets, using a stick and a leather ball but there are other possible predecessors as well, including an English game, called Kambuka. A Dutch game, Kalf, a French and Belgian game called, Chol, and a French game, Jeu de Mail. But the game as we know it, the rules, equipment, and 18-hole course, certainly developed in Scotland, where it was played as early as the early 1400s. The rules of the game were also codified there, the rules of golf was published in 1754 by the St. Andrews Golfers, later called the Royal and Ancient Golf Club. The first golf club, formed 1744, was the Honourable Company of Edinburgh Golfers in Edinburgh, Scotland. And it was none other than Mary, Queen of Scots, 1542-1587, who is credited with being both the first woman golfer and the originator of the term caddy. The term is derived from the French term for the royal pages, cadets, who carried the Queen's clubs. What is solidarity?
it was a worker-led movement for political reform in Poland. During the 1980s and it led to the downfall of communism. The movement was inspired by Pope John Paul II's June 1979 visit to his native Poland, where in Warsaw, he delivered a speech to millions, calling for a free Poland and a new kind of solidarity. As scholar and author Timothy Garton Ash noted, without the Pope, no solidarity. Without solidarity, no Gorbachev. Without Gorbachev, no fall of communism. Shipyard electrician Lech Walesa, 1943, became the leader of Solidarity. Formed in 1980 when 50 labor unions banded together to protest Poland's communist government. The union staged strikes and demonstrations. By 1981 Solidarity had gained so many followers that it threatened Poland's government. Which responded, with the support of the Soviet Union, by instituting martial law in December of that year. The military cracked down on the activities of the unions. Abolishing Solidarity in 1982 and arresting its leaders, including the charismatic Walensa. But the powerful People's Movement, which had also swept up farmers, who formed the Rural Solidarity, could not be suppressed. Martial law was lifted in mid 1983, but the government continued to exert control over the people's freedom. That year, Walensa received the Nobel Peace Prize for his efforts to gain workers' rights and prevent violence. Solidarity continued its work for reform. In 1989 the collapse of communism on the horizon, people's movements in Eastern Europe had combined with Soviet leader Mikhail Gorbachev's policy of glasnost to herald the system's demise. The Polish government reopened negotiations with Solidarity's leadership. Free elections were held that year, with the Labour Party candidates gaining numerous seats in Parliament. In 1990 Walesa was elected president, at which time he resigned as chairman of Solidarity. Poland's Communist Party was dissolved that year. When did the first Africans arrive in the British colonies of North America? In 1619 a Dutch ship carrying 20 Africans landed at Jamestown, Virginia. They were put to work as servants, not as slaves. Though they had fewer rights than their white counterparts, they were able to gain their freedom and acquire property. Which prompted the development of a small class of free Negroes in colonial Virginia. For example, there is record of an Anthony Johnson arriving in Virginia in 1621 as a servant. He was freed one year later, and about 30 years after that he imported five servants himself. Receiving from Virginia 250 acres of land for so doing. What caused the nuclear accident at Chernobyl? The April 1986 accident the world's worst nuclear power plant disaster was caused by explosions at the Soviet power plant. Sending radioactive clouds across much of northern Europe. 
According to the World Nuclear Association, the accident was the result of a flawed reactor design that was operated with inadequately trained personnel and without proper regard for safety. The trouble began at 1.24 a.m. on Saturday, April 26, when Unit 4 of the Chernobyl nuclear power plant about 70 miles outside of the Ukrainian capital of Kiev, was rocked by two enormous explosions. The roof was blown off the plant and radioactive gases and materials were sent more than a half mile into the atmosphere. Though two workers were killed instantly, there was no official announcement about the hazardous blast. It was the Swedes who detected a dramatic increase in windborne radiation. And on April 28 two full days after the accident news of the event was briefly reported by the Soviet news agency TASS. Two weeks later, on May 14, First Secretary Mikhail Gorbachev, 1931 went on national television and explained what officials knew about the accident. More details were revealed over the following months. The explosions were caused by an unauthorized test carried out by plant operators who were trying to determine what would happen in the event of a power outage. There were six critical errors made by workers during the testing, which combined to spell disaster. Perhaps the most significant of these mistakes was turning off the emergency coolant system. Once the test was underway, further mistakes caused the core to heat to more than 9,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Producing molten metal that reacted with what cooling? Water was left to produce hydrogen gas and steam, resulting in a powerful explosion. What caused the second explosion is not clear, and experts disagree on what might have happened. Some theorize that it was a pure nuclear reaction. What was the investiture struggle? Also called the investiture controversy. It is the name for the power struggle between kings and popes during the Middle Ages, 500-1350. Since the Papal States played the same role in medieval society as the other states, fiefs and manors, which were held by kings, their lords, who were members of the clergy, eventually became subject to the same human weaknesses that guided the feudal lords and kings namely, corruption and greed. Popes became powerful and worldly leaders. The struggle for supremacy peaked in 1075 when Pope Gregory VII, c. 1020-1085, who was trying to protect the Church from the influence of Europe's powerful leaders, issued a decree against lay investitures, meaning that no one except the Pope could name bishops or heads of monasteries. German King Henry IV, 1050 to 1106, who was engaged in a power struggle with Saxon nobles at the time, took exception to Gregory's decree and challenged it, asserting that the kings should have the right to name the bishops. This was an important point of disagreement. Since kings wanted to be in the favor of the pope, and popes were selected from among the bishops. So, it was not purely a religious issue, political power was also at stake.
Henry was excommunicated by the Pope. Though he later sought and was granted forgiveness by Gregory, the struggle did not end there. Henry soon regained political support, deposed Gregory, in 1084, and set up an anti-Pope, Clement III, who, in turn, crowned him Holy Roman Emperor. The debate over whose right it was to invest clergymen with. The symbol of office continued through much of the Middle Ages. What were the lasting effects of the Harlem Renaissance? The Harlem Renaissance, 1925-35, marked the first time that white Americans, principally intellects and artists, gave serious attention to the culture of African Americans. The movement, which had by some accounts begun as early as 1917, was noted in a 1925 New York Herald Tribune article that announced, We are on the edge. If not in the midst, of what might not improperly be called a Negro Renaissance. The first African American Rhodes scholar, Alan Locke, 1886 to 1954 who was a professor of philosophy at Howard University led and shaped the movement during which Upper Manhattan became a hotbed of creativity in the post World War 1 1914 to 18 era Not only was there a flurry activity but there was a heightened sense of pride as well the movement left the country with a legacy of literary works including those by Gene Toomer. His 1923 work Kane is generally considered the first work of the Harlem Renaissance, Langston Hughes. The Negro Speaks of Rivers, 1921, The Weary Blues, 1926, County Cullen, Color, 1925, Copper Sun, 1927, Jesse R. Fawcett, novelist and editor of The Crisis, the journal of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, or NAACP, Claude McKay, whose 1928 novel Home to Harlem evokes strong criticism from W.E.B. Du Bois and Alain Locke for its portrayal of black life, and Zora Neale Hurston. The author of the highly acclaimed 1937 novel Their Eyes Were Watching God, who was the first black woman to be honored for her creative writing with a prestigious Guggenheim Fellowship. The Harlem Renaissance was not only about literature. Jazz and blues music also flourished during the prosperous times of the post-war era. During the 1920s and 1930s Louis Armstrong, Jelly Roll Morton, Duke Ellington, Bessie Smith and Josephine Baker rose to prominence. Their contributions to music performance are still felt by artists and audiences. Regardless of color, today. How did the Treaty of Versailles pave the way for World War II? In the aftermath of World War I, 1914-18, Germany was severely punished. One clause in the Treaty of Versailles even stipulated that Germany take responsibility for causing the war. 
In addition to its territorial losses, Germany was also made to pay for an Allied military force that would occupy the west bank of the Rhine River, intended to keep Germany in check for the next 15 years. The treaty also limited the size of Germany's military. In 1921 Germany received a bill for reparations, it owed the Allies $33 million. While the post-war German government had been made to sign the Treaty of Versailles under the threat of more fighting from the Allies, the German people nevertheless faulted their leaders for accepting such strident terms. Not only was the German government weakened, but public resentment over the Treaty of Versailles soon developed into a strong nationalist movement led by German Chancellor and Führer Adolf Hitler, 1889-1945. What was the worst hurricane in you? S. History Hurricane Katrina, which hit the Gulf Coast in late August 2005, was not only the most disastrous hurricane in U.S. history, it was the nation's worst single weather disaster. Though not the strongest possible hurricane when it made landfall, Katrina had weakened from a Category 5 storm to a Category 4 storm just before it struck the Gulf Coast. Katrina was a monster, the storm stretched about 200 miles in diameter, packed winds up to 145 miles per hour. Produced torrential rain and huge waves, spawned twisters throughout the region and pushed up a 28-foot storm surge a surge usually found only in Category 5 hurricanes. Katrina moved ashore on the Gulf Coast on Monday, August 29, in anticipation of the hurricane. New Orleans, which sits below sea level, had been evacuated. But there were still tens of thousands who stayed out of necessity, such as law enforcement and health care workers. Because they were unable to evacuate, or because they chose not to leave, some 23,000 of those who stayed holed up in the aging Superdome Sports Arena, which was set up as an emergency shelter. The structure barely withstood the lashing winds of Katrina, which blew off portions of the dome. On Tuesday morning, after Katrina ravaged Louisiana, Mississippi, and Alabama, before weakening as it moved inland. Officials and news reporters generally agreed that there was unbelievable damage all along the coast. But New Orleans had dodged a bullet, the Big Easy had not taken the worst of it. Gulfport and Biloxi, Mississippi appeared the hardest hit. The devastation there was astonishing. As reports of damage began to be made, it became clear that about 90% of the structures along the Gulf Coast were destroyed and hundreds of thousands of people were displaced by Katrina. The death toll was not known, and officials conceded it would take time to determine. The storm had been so ruinous of biblical proportions. Some said that rescue and recovery would take weeks and months. Later, when the full extent of damage began to be discovered, the recovery estimates were revised to years. Later Tuesday, New Orleans' fate changed, levees that protect the city could not hold back a swollen Lake Pontchartrain. 
80% of the city filled with water, 25 feet deep. Officials and volunteers could not get flood victims out fast enough. Usually plucking them from rooftops or finding them in attics, where survivors sought refuge as waters rose. The city descended into chaos and lawlessness. Heart-wrenching images of human despair filled the media, touching people around the nation. Americans responded with donations of money, goods, and time. The American Red Cross launched the largest mobilization effort in its history. The Federal Emergency Management Agency, FEMA, a part of the Department of Homeland Security DHS. The Coast Guard, also part of the DHS, and the U.S. military struggled to keep pace with Katrina's aftermath all along the coast. For all the effort, it was widely acknowledged that the government's response to the disaster was inadequate and late. On Friday, September 2, President George W. Bush said that the results had been unacceptable, he further promised to make it right. While politicians and the people spoke out on the subject. Some experts said the catastrophe had simply overwhelmed the system, emergency programs across the nation had been set up to rely on local and state response first, backed by the federal government. In Katrina's case, the devastation was so great that the localities and states either were not able to respond at all or could not respond with enough help. Federal intervention had been needed sooner and in greater measure to alleviate human suffering and protect lives. Government officials all seemed of one accord, however, the fact-finding could wait, the victims could not. Cities and states across the nation sent resources to the Gulf Coast and set up emergency centers to receive storm refugees. Whose needs were immediate, water, food, clothing, shelter, medicine, health care, and counseling, and long-term, jobs, schools, and permanent housing. On Wednesday, September 7, nine days after Katrina struck, the situation continued to unfold. The size and scope of the tragedy remained to be fully understood. New Orleans ordered a forced evacuation of the holdouts, the city remained flooded with toxic floodwaters as repairs were made in the levees and the hazardous water began to be pumped out. Efforts to reunite families, separated in the chaos, were ongoing. For many days, rescue workers all along the Gulf Coast had moved from house to house to find survivors. Now it was a matter of trying to identify and count the dead. The death toll was expected to be in the thousands. The affected area was 90,000 square miles, or about the size of Minnesota. Property damage was projected to be at least $26 billion in. Insured losses and perhaps twice that amount in uninsured losses. Katrina had also caused damages as it struck Florida as a Category 1 hurricane on August 26. It later moved into the warm waters of the Gulf of Mexico and strengthened before striking the Gulf Coast. Katrina's aftermath was felt in every state of the Union. Volunteers shored up efforts to assist survivors who were being relocated in an effort to ease the burden on the afflicted region. Schools across the nation opened doors to displaced students. 
fuel prices skyrocketed and natural gas and heating oil prices promised to follow, as offshore rigs and Gulf Coast refineries suffered. And most Americans worried about the government's response to the catastrophe. The disaster made an impact around the world as well, with some 95 countries offering assistance. Before Katrina, the deadliest hurricane to strike the United States was an unnamed Category 4 storm that struck Galveston, Texas, in 1900. The September 8 storm claimed at least 8,000 lives. Some estimates place the number as high as 12,000. Hurricane strength is measured on the Saffir Simpson scale where Category 1 is the weakest. With sustained winds of at least 74 miles per hour and a storm surge of 4 to 5 feet above normal, and Category 5 is the strongest. With sustained winds of more than 155 miles per hour and a storm surge higher than 18 feet. The United States has been hit by three Category 5 storms since record-keeping began. The first was a Labor Day hurricane, which struck the Florida Keys in 1935, 408 people died. The second was Camille, which hit Mississippi and southeast Louisiana in 1969, claiming 256 lives. Hurricane Andrew, which struck South Miami-Dade County, Florida. In late August 1992, was measured as a Category 4 storm at the time, but the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Agency NOAA, reclassified it in 2002 as a Category 5 storm. Andrew claimed more than 100 lives and devastated a wide area. Mostly around the town of Homestead, Florida. What happened on Apollo 13? On April 13, 1970, a damaged coil caused an explosion in one of the oxygen tanks on the moonbound U.S. spacecraft, leaving astronauts Jim Lovell, Jack Swigert, and Fred Hayes in a disastrous situation. The explosion damaged the fuel cells as well the craft's heat shield, which was needed to protect the vessel upon re-entry into Earth's atmosphere. While the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, NASA, had experienced a previous disaster in 1967, when three astronauts died in a fire on the launch pad mission control had not faced anything like this before. And no Americans had ever been lost in space. After hearing a loud bang and seeing an oxygen tank empty, the Apollo 13 astronauts reported to mission control at the Johnson Space Center, OK, Houston, we've had a problem. The ensuing real-life drama proved that to be an understatement. The crew moved into the craft's tiny lunar module, designed to keep two men alive for just two days. With the astronauts four days from home, NASA engineers had their work cut out for them. Among other measures, the temperature in the module was lowered to 38 degrees Fahrenheit to conserve oxygen and electricity. The world was waiting and watching as the module splashed down in the South Pacific. Just barely ahead of the failure of the oxygen. All three astronauts survived the disaster, which came to be known as the successful failure. 
Apollo 13 never reached its destination but, despite the odds, made it back to Earth safely. Which you? S. State was the first to abolish slavery. Vermont was first, in 1777. On July 8 of that year Vermont adopted a state constitution that prohibited slavery. The first document in the United States to outlaw slavery, it read in part, no male person born in this country, or brought from overseas, ought to be holden by law, to serve any person, as a servant, slave or apprentice, after he arrives to the age of 21 years, nor female, in like manner. After she arrives to the age of 18 years, unless they are bound by their own consent. After they arrive to such age, or bound by law, for the payment of debts, damages, fines, costs, or the like. Vermont's constitution also gave suffrage to all men, regardless of race. Vermonters were the first to put a black legislator in the state house, Alexander Twilight. 1795 to 1857, was elected as a representative in 1836. Twilight also earned another first. In 1823 he graduated from Vermont's Middlebury College to become the first black person in the nation to earn a college degree. Who was Florence Nightingale? The English nurse, hospital reformer, and philanthropist is considered the founder of modern nursing. The daughter of well-to-do British parents, Florence Nightingale, 1820-1910, was born in Florence, Italy. Though she was raised in privilege on her family's estate in England. Nightingale had a natural and irrepressible inclination toward caring for others. Despite her parents' wishes, Nightingale who, in accordance with the social standards of her set and day had already been presented to the Queen entered a training program for nurses near Dusseldorf, Germany. She went on to study in Paris. In 1853 Nightingale became superintendent of a hospital for invalid women in London. In 1854 Nightingale took 38 nurses with her to the city of Uskudar, near Istanbul, Turkey. There, despite great obstacles, she set up a barrack hospital to treat soldiers who were injured in the Crimean War. 1853 to 56, then being fought between Russian forces and the Allied armies of Britain, France, the Ottoman Empire, present-day Turkey, and Sardinia, part of present-day Italy. Nightingale set about cleaning the filthy hospital facility. Established strict schedules for the staff and introduced sanitation methods that reduced the spread of infectious diseases such as cholera, typhus, and dysentery. While her methods were considered controversial at first, doctors initially found Nightingale to be demanding and pushy, they got results. Before long, Nightingale was put in charge of all the Allied Army hospitals in the Crimea. 
During the fighting Nightingale visited the front and caught Crimean fever, which threatened her life. By this time she had become so well known that Queen Victoria 1819-1901, was aware of and deeply concerned about Nightingale's illness. By the end of the war, Nightingale's care of the sick and wounded was legendary. Known for walking the floor of the hospital at night, tending her patients, she became known as the Lady with the Lamp. After the war Nightingale returned to London and in 1860, with £50,000 sterling. She established a training institution for nurses in London. In 1873 Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston, Bellevue Hospital in New York City, and New Haven Hospital in Connecticut opened the United States' first nursing schools. All of them were patterned after the London program founded by Nightingale. Nightingale's fierce determination, which ran contrary to her parents' wishes. For her as well as to the social standard of the day, made her a legend. And rightly so, because of her concern for the sick, the standard of care of all patients improved. When was the first kindergarten? The world's first kindergarten opened in 1837 in Blankenburg, Germany. Under the direction of educator Friedrich Froebel, 1782-1852. Froebel went on to establish a training course for kindergarten teachers. And he introduced the schools throughout Germany. Such schools and classes for children ages 4 to 6 are the norm today in much of the world. How did cable TV develop? The industry had its beginnings in the 1970s, when home box office HBO, started to beam its signal to customers on a subscription basis. It was a radical concept, let audiences pay direct for the programming, in this case, movies. Rather than having it wholly supported through advertising and, in some cases, Syndication fees. Another development during that decade proved to have lasting effect, Southern businessman Ted Turner. 1938, bought an independent TV station based in Atlanta and dubbed it a superstation. WTBS was soon made available to some 10 million subscribing households and was the beginning of Turner's cable TV empire which would later include Cable News Network, CNN, CNN's headline news. Turner Network Television, TNT, and, briefly, the music network VH1. Soon there were a number of niche-based cable networks airing programming around the clock, music television, MTV was reaching teens and 20-somethings, lifetime targeted women, ESPN focused on sports, black entertainment television. Bet, catered to the African-American audience, and American movie classics, AMC. Appealed to a cross-section of American viewers who share a fondness for old, mostly black and white, movies. By the 1980s the three major television networks, which had risen to power in the 1950s and had 
remained on the top of their game for the next two decades, found that their audience share was dropping. This was aided by the introduction of the upstart Fox Television Network. Backed by media mogul Rupert Murdoch, 1931. Fox's programming, geared toward a young, hip, and increasingly multicultural audience, found its own following. Soon Americans had more choices than ever before and for a relatively low subscription cost. By the 1990s the big three networks, NBC, ABC, and CBS, were reaching only 61% of the television audience. Not to be beaten at their own game, the networks responded to the new competition by producing more cutting-edge shows programs that likely would not have made it on the air before the advent of cable. Further, they began charging their affiliate stations for programming a trend begun by CBS in 1992. Who were the great Islamic philosophers of the Middle Ages? Three thinkers of the Islamic world stand out as important interpreters of Greek thought. And therefore, as a bridge between ancient philosophy and the scholasticism of the Middle Ages. Their Latin names are Ava Nassar, Averroes, and Avicenna. Ava Nassar, c. 878-950, who studied with Christian Aristotelians in Baghdad, Iraq, proved so adept at applying the teachings of Aristotle, 384-322 BC. To Muslim thought that he became known as the second Aristotle or the second teacher. He posited that philosophy and religion are not in conflict with each other. Rather, they parallel one another. Also known for his work in interpreting the great Aristotle for the Muslim world. Avicenna, 980-1037 is sometimes referred to as the third teacher. He was also the first to expand the distinction between essence and existence. Averroes, 1126-1198, also was no stranger to Aristotle, writing commentaries on him as well as Plato. Specifically, the Republic. He also wrote on religious law and philosophy as well as religion and logic. Who were the apostles? The apostles were twelve men chosen by Jesus Christ, c. 6b.ccad30, to be his close followers. The apostles helped spread the word that they believed Jesus to be the Son of God. Matthew 10:1 explains that Jesus gave the twelve authority to drive out unclean spirits and to cure every kind of illness. In Matthew 10, 2-4, the names of the twelve apostles are given as Simon Peter, who is later simply called Peter, Andrew, James, John, Philip, Bartholomew, Thomas. Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot. 
but the lists of apostles found in Luke 6 colon 13 16 and in Acts 1 13 differ from that found in Matthew. While both Luke and Acts cite, Simon, Peter, Andrew, James, John, Philip, Bartholomew, Thomas, Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, they do not name Thaddeus, but rather Judas the son of James. In other words, the lists agree on 11 of the 12 names. After Judas Iscariot betrayed Jesus Christ, Matthias was chosen by the apostles to take his place, this is described in Acts 1 21 26. He was considered eligible since, like the eleven remaining apostles. He accompanied Jesus from the time of Jesus' baptism until the day he was taken up from us. Did Newton really formulate the laws of motion after observing an apple falling from a tree? While it may sound more like legend than fact, Newton maintained that it was true. In 1665 Sir Isaac Newton, 1642-1727, who was newly graduated from Cambridge University, escaped bubonic plague London and was visiting the family farm. There he saw an apple fall to the ground and he began considering the force that was responsible for the action. He theorized that the apple had fallen because all matter attracts other matter. That the rate of the apple's fall was directly proportional to the attractive force that earth exerted upon it. And that the force that pulled the apple was also responsible for keeping the moon in orbit around earth. But he then set aside these theories and turned his attention to experimenting with light. In the 1680s Newton revisited the matter of the apple, taking into consideration Galileo's 1564-1642, Studies of Motion, 1602-09. From which the Italian scientist had concluded that falling objects accelerate at a constant rate. In 1687, Newton, with the considerable support of his friend Edmund Halley, of Halley's comet fame, published Principia Mathematica, Mathematical Principles of Natural Philosophy, which outlined the laws of gravity and planetary motion. Newton arranged Galileo's findings into three basic laws of motion, 1, a body, any object or matter in the universe that is at rest tends to remain at rest, and a body in motion tends to remain in motion moving in the same direction, unless acted upon by an outside force, this is the law of inertia. 2. The force to move a body is equal to its mass times acceleration, F equals ma, where F is force. M is mass, and A is acceleration, and 3, for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. These three laws allowed Newton to calculate the gravitational force between Earth and the Moon. Who were the big four? Though the Paris Peace Conference, which began in January 1919, was attended by representatives of all the Allied nations, 
the decisions were made by four heads of government, called the Big Four, President Woodrow Wilson. 1856-1924, of the United States, Prime Minister David Lloyd George, 1863-1945, of Great Britain. Premier Georges Clemenceau, 1841-1929, of France, and Premier Vittorio Orlando, 1860-1952, of Italy. Other representatives formed committees to work out the details of the treaties that were drawn up with each of the countries that had made up World War I Central Powers. The Treaty of Versailles was signed with Germany, the Treaty of St. Germain was signed with Austria, the Treaty of New Italy was made with Bulgaria. The Treaty of Trianon was made with Hungary, and the Treaty of Sevres was signed with the Ottoman Empire. Which was the first TV network? It was the National Broadcasting Company, NBC, founded November 11, 1926, by David Sarnoff. 1891 to 1971, who was then president of Radio Corporation of America, RCA. Sarnoff, considered one of the pioneers of radio and television broadcasting. Created NBC to provide a program service to stimulate the sale of radios. In the 1940s he reorganized the network to provide TV programming. Again to stimulate sales of RCA products this time, televisions. It was Sarnoff who demonstrated television at the World's Fair in New York in 1939. Next came Columbia Broadcasting System. CBS, on September 26, 1928, which was established by William S. Paley, 1901-1990, an advertising manager for Congress Cigar Company. Paley sold some of his stock in the cigar company in order to raise $275,000 to buy into the beleaguered United Independent Broadcasters, which controlled Columbia Phonograph, hence the name. He built the floundering radio network into a powerful and profitable broadcasting organization. The American Broadcasting Corporation ABC, television network was last. In 1943, it was only by government order that the third network, ABC, was created at all. In 1943, when RCA was ordered to give up one of its two radio networks, it surrendered the weaker of the two, NBC Blue, which was bought by Edward J. Noble, the father of Lifesavers Candy. In 1945 Noble formally changed the name to the American Broadcasting Company, which three years later began broadcasting television from its New York flagship station. How long have trains been in use? Trains date as far back as the 16th century when crude railroads operated in the underground coal and iron ore mines of Europe. These systems consisted of two wooden rails that extended into the mines and across the mine floors. Wheeled wagons were pulled along the rails by men or by horses. 
Early in the 18th century, mining companies expanded on this rail system. Bringing it above ground to transport the coal and iron ore. Workers found that they could cover the wooden rails with iron so they wouldn't wear out as quickly. Before long, rails were made entirely of iron. Meanwhile, the steam engine had been developed. An engineer in the mines of Cornwall, England, Richard Trevi Thick, 1771-1833, constructed a working model of a locomotive engine in 1797. Three years later, he built the first high-pressure steam engine. He made quick progress from there, building a road carriage which on Christmas Eve 1801 became the first vehicle to convey passengers by steam. Two years later, the inventor had built the world's first steam railway locomotive. In 1825 progress in rail transportation was made by another English inventor. George Stevenson, 1781-1848, who, after patenting his own locomotive engine. 1815, finished construction on the world's first public railroad. The train ran a distance of about 20 miles, conveying passengers from Stockton to Darlington, England. In 1830 Stevenson completed a line between Liverpool and Manchester. Rail travel caught on quickly and remains an efficient means of transport today. With commuters around the world relying on trains to get them to work each day. While Stevenson went on to build more railways, and build a family business in the process. Trevi Thick did not fare nearly as well, though he later found other uses for the high-pressure steam engine including rock boring, dredging, and agriculture, he died penniless. What was the golden age of ancient Greece? It is the period of classical Greek civilization that followed the so-called Dark Ages of Greece. Which came to an end about 800 B. C. Over time the Dorians had become more settled. And they gradually revived trade and culture on mainland Greece. The self-governing city-state, Polis, evolved including the military center of Sparta and Athens. Which became a center for the arts, education, and democracy. This was the beginning of the Great Hellenic Period of Classical Greek Civilization. Greek Civilization reached its height in Athens during the mid-400s BC. A period of outstanding achievement known as the Golden Age. Why was President Andrew Johnson impeached? In late February 1868 nine articles of impeachment were brought against Andrew Johnson over political and ideological differences between the President and Congress. Johnson self-educated, self-made, and outspoken inspired people to either love or hate him. A Southern Democrat in the U.S. Senate. He broke bonds of home and party when he swore allegiance to the Union after the outbreak of the Civil War, 1861-65. This 
This he did because of his strong personal belief that the Southern states had violated the U.S. Constitution when they seceded from the Union. Soon this Tennessean and former Democrat shared the Union Party ticket with Republican Abraham Lincoln. 1809-1865, as he ran for re-election to the presidency in the fall of 1864. Inaugurated in March. Vice President Johnson became President Johnson that fateful mid-April day when Lincoln was shot as he sat watching a play at Washington, D.C.S. Ford's Theater. But Johnson's troubles had already begun. As he and Lincoln took the oath of office in March, Johnson appeared to be drunk. Some attributed this to the fact that he was recovering from typhoid fever. But one journalist labeled him a drunken clown, and a group of senators began calling for his resignation. Lincoln met with his vice president for the first and what would turn out to be the last time on. April 14, just hours before Lincoln's life was claimed by assassin John Wilkes Booth, 1838-1865. As president, Johnson's true colors shined through. Again allegiant to his homeland, his policies toward southern states were lenient. Ever class conscious, he used the power of his office to demonstrate to the southern aristocrats whom he openly despised, just how far a poor man from North Carolina had come, as a state's rights advocate. He was ever watchful of any congressional bills that might impinge upon the freedoms of the individual states. And as a racist, he proved reticent to grant rights or protection to blacks. All of these traits combined to create sticking points between Johnson and Congress. In February 1866 Congress voted to extend the life of the Freedmen's Bureau. A War Department agency that assisted blacks and whites. But Johnson vetoed the measure, and Congress was unable to overturn his veto. Later that year Congress passed the Civil Rights Act of 1866. A bill that extended citizenship to freed slaves and guaranteed them equal protection of the laws. Believing this piece of legislation overstepped the boundaries of central government. He felt this sort of lawmaking was up to each state, he again vetoed it. But this time Congress mustered the votes it needed to overturn a presidential veto. It was the first of many veto overrides during Johnson's administration. Feeling Johnson was ill-equipped to run the nation. Congress moved its meeting time so that it could keep an eye on the executive branch. Meantime, Congress was guiding Reconstruction policy. The southern states were being run by their military administrators, reporting to General Ulysses S. Grant. 1822-1885, in 1867 Congress passed a law, the Tenure of Office Act. Preventing the President from removing any cabinet member without Congress's permission. By this time, Congress has already begun to consider whether Johnson ought to be impeached. That fall, President Johnson pardoned many Confederate generals and officials. Further raising the ire of Congress and the nation. Johnson's popularity was waning. The following February. Grant attempted to replace Edwin Stanton, 1814-1869, as Secretary of War. Stanton, who was favored by Congress, 
refused to leave his office. Physically chaining himself to his desk. Congress view Johnson's move as a violation of the Tenure of Office Act. And proceeded to hold impeachment hearings in the House of Representatives. Within a few days, the House approved a resolution of impeachment. On March 13, the trial began in the Senate. On May 19, the Senate voted on one of the articles of impeachment it was considered to be the one most likely to receive the two thirds majority vote required to convict the President. The measure failed by one vote. Subsequent votes resulted in the same tally. While many believe Johnson was an inadequate and unpopular president who made numerous mistakes while in office. Many others believe he was not guilty of the high crimes and misdemeanors called for in Article 2, Section 4, of the Constitution. In fact, the law that he was accused of breaking. The Tenure of Office Act was later overturned as unconstitutional. What was the Red Terror? The Red Terror was the brutal coercion used by the Communists during the tumultuous years of Civil unrest that followed the Bolshevik Revolution of November 1917. After the revolution, the Bolsheviks, now called communists, put their leader, Vladimir Lenin, 1870-1924, into power. Delivering on the Bolshevik promise to end the country's involvement in World War I, 1914-18. Lenin immediately called for peace talks with Germany, ending the fighting on the Eastern Front. Germany and the other Central Powers would be prevented from victory on the Western Front by the entry of the United States into the war that same year. But the Brest-Litovsk Treaty, signed March 3, 1918, dictated harsh and many believed humiliating terms to Russia which was forced to give up vast territories including Finland, Poland, Belarus, Ukraine, Moldavia, and the Baltic states of Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania. Meantime, Russians had elected officials to a parliamentary assembly. But when the results were unfavorable to Lenin, of the 703 deputies chosen, only 168 were communists. He ordered his troops to bar the deputies from convening, and so the assembly was permanently disbanded. In its place, Lenin established a dictatorship based on communist secret police, the Chaika. Further, the radical social reforms he had promised took the form of government. Takeover of Russia's industries and the seizure of farm products from the peasants. Lenin's hard handed tactics created opposition to the communists, colloquially known as the Reds. The opposition organized their White Army, and civil war ensued. In September 1918, Lenin was nearly assassinated by a political opponent. prompting Lenin's supporters to organize the retaliative initiative that came to be known as the Red Terror. Though thousands of communist opponents were killed as a result, the unrest in Russia would not end until 1920. And some believe the ruthless repression of the Red Terror lasted into 1924.
Why is Shakespeare widely studied? English dramatist Ben Jonson 1572-1637, said it best when he proclaimed that Shakespeare was not of an age, but for all time. Most teachers and students, not to mention critics and theatergoers down through the ages. Likely agree with Johnson's remark, Shakespeare's canon, consisting of 37 plays, divided into comedies. Tragedies, or histories, plus poems and sonnets, expresses universal and unchanging human concerns as no other works have. Shakespeare's words are familiar even to those who have not studied them. Not simply because of the many contemporary adaptations of his works. But because Shakespearean phrases and variations thereof have, through the years, fallen into common usage. Consider these few examples from Hamlet alone, neither a borrower nor a lender be. To thine own self be true, and the plays the thing. No other writer's plays have been produced so often or read so widely in so many countries.